All righty. Uh, here we are right at 10, so we'll jump into it. Uh, welcome, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is McKinley Robinson. I'm a director here at Bercadia, um, where I focus on real estate, finance, and lending. And before we get started, we'd like to take a moment to thank our dealmaker sponsors, DLR Group, GLY Construction, as well as our developing leaders, annual sponsors, Karen Cross Impleman, Boss Adams, Tarragon, and Touchstone. Um, I do want to put a quick plug in for the community enhancement event. Due to COVID, we weren't able to have an in-person volunteer event this year. However, we do want uh, we do want to do what we can do. Um, so we're trying to not have it stop us from doing something. This year, we'll be hosting a food drive to support organizations throughout the region that successfully distribute food to families in need. We have partnered with Farmer Frog. Bird Bar Place and Mary's Place to set up three drop-off locations throughout the region to collect food. Um, if you're interested in participating, there's a few ways you can do so. You can volunteer collect, to collect food at one of the three drop-off locations. You can collect food from your network and drop it off at one of the three locations. Or uh, you can give online and all the proceeds will be distributed equally between the three organizations. For more information there, feel free to visit the NAV Washington website uh, where you'll find everything there. Now let's jump into it. Al has over 15 years of corporate facilities and real estate experience, first at Concur and later at SAP, the now parent company of Concur. Currently, Al, wor Al works at SAP's global real estate strategist and business partner to the Cloud Business Group. In addition to these roles, he acts as an intermediary between SAP's real estate broker, brokerage firm and their real estate and facilities team to develop strategy, strategies for each metro in which they are active. Embedded in all things SAP real estate, Al directs the global real estate portfolio, space planning, construction, international growth demands, and dozens of other responsibilities too long to go into. His background is as diverse as it is extensive from building 200,000 square feet of office space and relocating a 600 employee headquarters to being the on-air commentator of the Everett Silvertips. <laughs> Al has remained far ahead of trends when it comes to creative office space and flexible remote work. In addition to all of this, he sits on the board of directors for the Bellevue Downtown Association, where he works to make Concur's hometown ever more livable, clean, safe, and business friendly. Al, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, McKinley. Absolutely. So um, you wear several high-profile hats at SAP. Can you describe a little bit of each of these in detail? Yeah, sure. So my role, my role is split between uh, two halves, one half being a, a business partner to the cloud group. The cloud group is form, my, my former company, Concur, along with all the other cloud companies at SAP. Um, an, an intermediary between them and, and my group, which is Global Real Estate and Facilities, or GRF. So, so that's the business partnering side. The, the real estate strategy side is putting together plans and strategies around the world for our more complex locations where we've got multiple leases, multiple buildings, rapid growth, and, and, and developing plans with my peers in GRF to say, here's what we're going to do in this city. Here's what we're going to do in this city. Um, the roles work well together because cloud is growing so fast. They tend to need a lot of space and they tend to need a lot more space. So I'm constantly feeding information into that real estate strategy side and into my peers within GRF to say, Hey, this group's going to need more space. Let's update this strategy. So although I think about it in terms of two separate roles, they're really well, well threaded together because of the information flow back and forth. I see. Um, what sorts of things do you look at when you're looking at forming and planning these metro strategies for each metro or city or region? Uh, what are some of the things you look at that come into play when you're forming those, those strategies? So we start with uh, obviously the information that we have about the, uh, the leases that are, that are there. Um, what are the end dates? Do we have break clauses? Um, how, you know, what's it been like over the, the number of years that we've been there with the landlord? What's the political climate? What's, what's, the, what's the business climate? And then we look at the business side as well. What businesses are there? Like I said, what, what businesses are growing? Which businesses aren't growing? And 
all that gets fed into discussions that we have with our brokers, um, with some of our other folks that are involved with the development of the strategies. And we start to look at, well, what if we did this? Well, what if we did that? And we develop these plans where we put, we bullet out all of the things that we looked at. So it's completely transparent to anybody that would look at one of these strategies to say, we considered this, but we crossed it out and here's why. We considered this, we crossed it out and here's why. But this, this is the, 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 the direction that we're going to go in. And this is why it's the direction. The direction might be lower cost real estate. It might be um, access to space for growth needs. Um, it could be that we're going to move out of this location and move to another location because they want to develop the building in the condos. Real, real story. So, so there's lots of different things that can drive our, our, our final recommendation. But then the important part is, is that it doesn't sit on the shelf. Uh, we often refresh it at least once a year or if there's a trigger um, that, that causes us to refresh it. Now, you know, we're going to talk about COVID quite a bit today, I'm sure, but um, COVID is something that's going to cause us to look at all of our, our metro strategies and, and consider, you know, refreshing a lot of them because of that. Um, on that topic, how has some of your planning or viewpoints for the metro strategies changed with COVID? What are some of the things that um, maybe it has sped up or totally new things that you guys hadn't taken into to account before that are now having to be included in the list of variables for the metro strategies? Well, as we all get in invites for events like this and we listen to brokers and read papers, I think we're all trying to understand what that crystal ball is telling us for 2021 and beyond as it relates to real estate markets around the world. So what are we considering now? We're considering, uh, is there going to be a dip in the real estate market in the next 12 to 24 months? And if we think that there is going to be a dip, um, how big will that dip be? Will it be bigger in cities that were already kind of at the bottom of the real estate uh, cycle pre-COVID? Or is it going to apply evenly to all locations, whether you're talking about San Francisco, Seattle, or Birmingham, Alabama? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things we're looking at is that, do we think there's going to be a dip in the market? And if we do believe there's going to be a dip in the market, then the next thing is, is that, well, what locations do we have where leases are coming due? And in those locations where leases are coming due, we're going to say, hey, we've got a lease coming due in Q4 of 2021. Um, we're going to start negotiating with the landlord in Q1 or Q2. Uh, let's only do a one-year renewal there because we think there's going to be a significant dip in the market. Now, the landlord may want to do, not want to do that, and we have to consider relocating if that's the case. But that's what we're starting to look at as it relates to COVID is that is COVID going to cause a dip in the market that we want to take advantage of? I see. Yeah. Yeah. Taking advantage if you think it's moving one way or the other. Right. Um, and, and how it may differ across those markets. Do you, um, do you think it'll impact all markets equally or do you think the, the Birmingham's and the Boise's will, will react differently from San Francisco and Seattle? I think markets that were strong before will stay stronger. Um, I think it'll, they'll be more resilient, meaning mm -hmm. it, it, they'll, they'll still have dips. It may not be as big of a dip and, and it could take longer to see that dip. Um, but, but uh, everybody's going to be affected. It's just a matter of how much. And like I said, there's, there's no magic Excel formula that we use. We just plug in all the information that we have about a particular city and we have discussions around it with, with our brokers and come up to some sort of common agreement that, yeah, we do, we do expect to see a dip and we expect to see a dip by X percent and we think it'll happen by this date. Okay, well, based on that, let's talk about, you know, our lease situation and what we should do there. So I, I don't think it'll be even across the board, certainly not globally, but I think we're going to factor it into every single discussion we have around Metro strategies. I see. Okay. Um, so as the business partner to the cloud group, you're always having to plan far into the future when dealing with rapidly growing department and industry of cloud. What are some of the skills or personality traits that you think allow you to be successful at this? Well, relationship building is critical because having come from the concur side of, of, of the cloud, um, I have relationships with a lot of the leaders that, that, are, that are there. Um, some have gone and new ones have come in, so I've had to develop new relationships. So not just maintaining relationships, but developing new ones. I think building trust is another one as well. Uh, in an ideal world, I would, I would ask all of the cloud businesses within SAP to consider me part of their, their, their organization, part of their business unit, 
and invite me to their all hands calls or their quarterly reviews or that sort of thing, because then I can glean information about what they're planning. It's not always the case and that's always what I'm working towards, but sometimes it's just one-to-one -one conversations uh, via Zoom, via, via phone call, or hopefully via face-to-face -face in the future where I can, I, I can get some of that inside information about what their business is doing, um, what they're thinking about, what's working, what's not working, that obviously down, you know, downstream will have an impact on real estate. Yeah, okay, I understand. Um, are they constantly feeding into you kind of updates on where they, where they see either just general headcount and planning going or the you know, employees are complaining about this component of facilities or hear that you know, other uh, colleagues at different companies have this component and you know, they'd like that and that right. sort of thing. And then do you bring that up and try to roll that into the overall plan and, and work with them directly? Yeah, so that's that's the way it's supposed to work. Is that they would come to me for um, bu business uh, decisions that are going to impact real estate, but oftentimes they don't know. So it's it's probably eighty percent of the time me reaching out to them, asking them what's going on with their business, um, telling them, uh, g giving them a, a dashboard of information about uh, utilization. Uh, in certain cities around the world. And, and sometimes there's some, some emotional discussion around that because you say, hey, you know, in this city, your, your people are only coming in 30% of the time. And they say, no, 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 that, that's not true. It's they're coming in full time. Like, uh, we've got data here, you know, so th those are some difficult conversations sometimes because that will lead to discussions about less, less space in the office. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm constantly pushing on them to say, Hey, what are you doing in your business? What new initiatives do you have that are going to, uh, impact headcount that will obviously impact real estate? Um, and, and, and that they'll, you know, sometimes they'll beat around the bush a little bit cause they can't share it completely. Or if mm -hmm. that trust has been built, they'll say, Hey, you know, you can't say anything, but here's what we're going to do. It's going to happen in next quarter. Um, I oftentimes won't share a lot of that beyond that conversation, but, in the conversations we have about that particular location with my peers in global real estate, where we're talking about a lease extension or a lease renewal, I might say, let's hold on that and not, not give a reason, but knowing what the reason is. So I don't get a chance to build that trust. If I, if I don't uh, hold that information back that, that, that they, that they consider sensitive. Mm -hmm. I see. Have you noticed? So um, you came from concur, uh, to SAP when when Concur was acquired by SAP, have you noticed um, more flexibility or negotiating power with the larger SAP name behind you than Concur? I'm sure that all companies would like as much flexibility as possible with leases, um, so that they can expand and contract and relocate. Um, do you do you feel that you have a sense of um, opportunity because of that, so that you can kind of effectively do that, or is it still always a negotiation and always just as difficult to you know shorten leases and line all these things up for for a big metro well i definitely think that i get a i get a stronger sense from landlords that they want sap on the uh, on the placard in the building as far as tenants go but having said that as good as it looks for them to ha have sap on their balance sheet as a tenant um, it's always a negotiation. It's a negotiation to put a, a sign up on the building. It's a negotiation not to have a security deposit. So mm -hmm. I, I think we carry a little more weight now to, to, to either get those things in the case of signs or not do those things in the case of security deposits. But that doesn't mean that we avoid them altogether or that we get a sign every, every single time. So it's still always a negotiation. But yeah, you're right. The, the SAP name does carry a little more weight in the, in the negotiations. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. I'm sure that helps with that because lining up all of those sounds very challenging and difficult. Yes, yes, it does. Um, so one of your roles also involves integrating new companies that are acquired by SAP or SAP. Um, and I've heard from business leaders of the importance of integrating culture where you're looking at acquiring a company and, and uh, you know, pretty early on up front, I think people start looking at how is their culture? How does it compare to ours? Are we going to be able to effectively integrate or are we going to lose the talent, which is ultimately, I think, what most acquisitions are going after? Right. Uh, how do you look at that from a workplace standpoint along with culture? Are you looking at how the facilities differ, how their general kind of workspace and, um, and office needs differ and, and working with uh, cultural integration with that? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, the most recent one having been Qualtrics, uh, what we do is we, we, we start looking at, at, uh, at numbers first, you know, uh, how many locations do they have? How many people do they have? Where, you know, what, what, what's their portfolio look like? Where do they have locations that we have locations? And, you know, in, in a perfect world, and not even a perfect world, but in, in a black and white world, you would just say, well, they've got a location in Seattle and we've got a location in Seattle. Let's just move them into our space. But it, it takes a little bit more than that because there are, are certain situations where they have more space than we do or more open space and we, we want to move SAP into their location. Or um, they've got a space, but there's a 12-year tail left on the lease term and with, a, with no break clause, there's not much we can do there. So we have to dig into the nuts and bolts a little bit to, to understand the, the, the numbers behind it. But then as you pointed out with the culture, um, we do have, we, we know we have an impact on that. And so we want to understand what the culture is. And that often uh, results in, in, in uh, face-to-face meetings with, with the acquiring, acquired company at their headquarters. We get a sense for what their culture is like. We get to see their office space um, and, and, and what they're used to working in. And that way we can start to understand when after the deal closes, when they want to expand a location and they want to put ping pong tables out or basketball hoops up or, you know, have a beer for whatever, whatever it is, we understand where that's coming from. And the last thing we want to do is snuff that out. Uh, we want to integrate it. We want, we want to learn from, from them and maybe even take some things from their culture and apply them to ours. But the last thing we want to do is just snuff it out and say, you know, you're doing an SAP's way. That's the end of the discussion. So we're very careful about it. Or I, I think we, we're, we want them to understand what we're trying to do and what our culture is like. And, you know, we did, we did buy them, but we also bought them because of their success that they're having. And we don't want to ruin that success by just stuffing them into an SAP office and say, do it this way. So I, I would say um, a, a very predictive, predictable, uh, somewhat speedy, uh, urging of them to do some things, but not a demand. I see. Okay. Have you noticed that when you're, when you're looking at um, whether it's an acquisition or just an overall Metro and timing leases, do you feel a, a sense of more flexibility or relief in stronger markets like Seattle and Bellevue, where, you know, if you wanted to, to sublease office space, it's relatively easy and there's, you know, generally, appetite there, whereas some markets, the office, uh, office market isn't quite as tight. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think it's two things. It's, you know, when we're looking at those portfolios, where, where do they have office space that um, maybe has a short tail left on the term that we know we have space to, to integrate them? Those are easy. You know, let the, let the lease run out, move them in. They're three blocks away. But it's when, you know, they're in Seattle and we're in Bellevue it's not as easy just to say close the Seattle office and move them to Bellevue because we, mm-hmm. you know, you know the impact of that. So even though they can be in the same general area, sometimes it's not as easy just to integrate because of that distance between those two locations. Um, and the other thing is, is that oftentimes they have lo- uh, office space in locations that SAP doesn't, um, which is always surprising to me because when you look at the 400 plus locations around the world, I feel like we have offices everywhere, but um, those of you that, that, that watch the news closely may have seen that, that uh, SAP made an announcement to acquire a company called Emersys uh, this morning. Um, if you look at the careers uh, page of Emersys, they've got open positions in Indianapolis. I'm pretty sure SAP doesn't have an office in Indianapolis, but now we're going to, at least for some period of time. Um, you know, same thing with, with going back to Qualtrics. With, uh, with Qualtrics, they're headquartered in uh, Provo, Utah, and Seattle. Well, SAP didn't have an office in Utah. Well, now, now we do. So, so you know, the acquisition part of my role leads to you know trying to fit the puzzle pieces in in the best way possible. Where, like I said, you're not impacting the success of the company you acquired, but you're also trying to make good business decisions within a, a SAP as well. Yeah, I, I would imagine there's. Um kind of at a high level, it seems, oh, that's great. Now you have multiple offices. If you have employees here that want to live in Provo or Indianapolis, right. now there's flexibility. Right. Um, in reality, I think it, there's probably much more to it and and uh, it complicates things much further having multiple leases and and we'll, we'll see how remote work impacts this, but 
Yeah. I, I would, my guess would be um, teams are still generally consolidated in metros or regions together where you probably don't have a team across multiple time zones um, when they could all be in the same spot. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, the, the other thing that we find from acquisitions is that sometimes there are leases that are created uh, for customer reasons as well. Um, you've got a customer, maybe it's the, the, the U.S. government and, and they've, got a, they've got a requirement for you to have a certain office in, 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 in Virginia or um, an oiling company that's out in the middle of Alaska wants you to have an office in, you know, somewhere in Fairbanks or something like that. I, uh, I'm making up examples sort of there. But my point is, is that sometimes when we review these portfolios, we ask, why is this location here? And it's tied back to a customer. And if it's a significant customer, we don't want to lose that customer. We can't just close that office. So there's, there's lots that goes into, into that analysis of the portfolio. I see. Um, are you, is all of this data and information of the acquisitions being fed to you kind of um, in a well-organized place, or are you having to uh, hear about these announcements or reports of acquisitions and go in and say, "Oh shoot, there's <laughs> why is there a job opening in you know in the middle of nowhere here in this tiny right. town in West Texas?" Yeah, what do, we do about that. Um, it's a very carefully orchestrated process. There's a there's a whole M and A group internal to SAP that that looks at many different deals, and those deals ne never come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I often wouldn't hear about that deal because it's not necessary for me to begin any sort of analysis on, on deals that aren't going to happen. But usually when they're about 90% through to the point where they're going to do the deal, I start to hear information about it. I can start to do a little research internally. I can start to look at their webpage and try mm -hmm. and figure out where they are. But once, once the deal's announced, then typically I get access to a data room and in that data room, it's got all of their leases. It's got a spreadsheet with all their locations and number of people. And, and I start grabbing information from that data room and that's how I begin my analysis. I see. Um, in talking to the employees of uh, companies being acquired, what are, in your experience, what are some of the biggest concerns from a facility standpoint? I know um, acquisitions are always stressful on both sides. I think probably more so for the companies being acquired and, and their employees, but from a facility standpoint specifically, what are some of the things that um, those employees talk to you about or express concerns about, or maybe opportunity and excitement with having, having a company with more resources? Um, what are some of the, the things that the, uh, the company we are acquiring are asking about? Yeah, what, what are some of the things that those employees say, hey, we really like uh, this component of our workspace, or I'm not sure if they told you, you know, this is how we do things on Friday, yeah. but this, you know, this flexibility has really worked well for the team or right. uh, wh whatever the case may be. Well, I can, I can speak to that question from both the acquired company side as well as the SAP side, because having come from Concur, I was the person on the, on that side asking those questions about what, what was going to happen with SAP. So I think from, from the acquired company standpoint, yeah, they're excited about uh, a company like SAP that has, you know, a fairly significant uh, CapEx budget to build up some great office spaces. Oftentimes, when you acquire a company that's, you know, 100 to 500 employees, they're a little more scrappy. They're, they're, they're you know, putting desks together on the weekend with nuts and bolts. And, and so that can be part of their culture. So you have to be careful with that. Um, but I think they look forward to maybe some consistency around office design and office spaces and that sort of thing. I think they're concerned about losing their culture. I was con concerned about that. Um, so every single time I go into one of these discussions, I always put myself back into those concur shoes on that first day I met with SAP people to, uh, to really be sensitive to, oh, oh, here comes the big beast to take over our space. And we want to, you know, mm -hmm. we want to be careful with that. So. I, I try and straddle both sides of the fence and say, what are they concerned about? And like, let me address that. And then what are we uh, staff concerned about? And let me discuss that as, as well. But I think that the office space is probably a big one from a, from a facility standpoint. I think from a real estate standpoint, the concern is, pro and, and maybe the facilities one as well, the concern is process. Listen, when you, when you join a uh, a company of SAP size, you've got to understand there's processes for processes. It's just part of being a big company. Um, 
having said that, we're very uh, patient with the acquired company to say, here's what our process is. Here's what you have to do. Here's why we do it. And we help them understand it. And we have, oh, we have conversations many, many times about how to follow that process. I think it can be frustrating from the acquired company standpoint because they're used to, you know, needing a, a, a monitor and going down to the local Costco and just buying it and expensing it. Well, that's not how it works at SAP. So I think that what that leads to is discussions around, hey, you're slowing us down. And so we have to work hard to say, we don't want to slow you down, but this is the process we want you to follow. follow. Let me help you learn the process so that we don't slow you down. I see. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, that, that all makes perfect sense. And I, I, can, I can imagine those conversations on, on both sides trying to communicate the value to them that um, you know, there, there are a number of resources behind you. It's a, a slow moving ship, so be patient with us, but exactly. trust us when, you know, when we say we'll, we'll work to, to uh, integrate you in well and, and yeah. you know, keep you happy with the facility. That's right. um, so in, internally, uh, you guys have a real estate brokerage firm. Can you describe or, or explain a little bit uh, the role of the real estate brokerage firm itself and then um, your role as an intermediary between that and real estate and facilities? Yeah, sure. So it's 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 so we have a real estate group internally. It's a small group, but we we um, we interface with a with a uh, real estate brokerage firm externally. Colliers is our is our global uh, real estate uh, uh, firm right now, and the way we interface with them is that we give them access to some information, but not all information because some of it is just too sensitive to give. Um, for instance, they would love to have access to all of our growth information, growth numbers, but there's also some locations where it's not growth. Maybe it goes down and that becomes very sensitive. If I say, hey, in this city, the, the headcount's going to be cut in half. Well, yeah. if that information got out, that'd be bad. So, you know, we give them as much information as we can. We sometimes parse it out in little bits and, and, and you know, they'll work on a strategy for for Seattle and we'll say, hey, here's all the growth information for Seattle and Bellevue because you know we know this location's growing and they'll help us build that strategy. They work with um, the regions, the, our, our four regions around the world at the ground level to, to negotiate leases. And so we'll put together engagement notices for them and they'll work with the local global real estate and facilities people to uh, go out and negotiate leases with landlords. But for, for, for me and my team, it's a lot of discussion around planning, around analysis, around a strategy, uh, putting together those metro strategies, um, helping us calculate financials, high level financials on comparing four different options in a city and, and, and that sort of thing. So it doesn't typically get down to the lease negotiation uh, with my group. It's more about the forward looking uh, strategies and, and, and analysis. I see. What are the, you mentioned there's four major regions. What are those regions? So we've got, we have the, the Americas, which is broken up into uh, North and South America. Mm -hmm. We have uh, APJ, Asia, Asia Pacific and Japan. Um, we've got EMEA. Uh, and, and then the fourth one is we actually have a, um, a DAC, a, a German region as well, okay. because that's okay. where SAP is headquartered and there's yeah. lots of different nuances that happen there. I see. Okay. Um, are you, I would imagine there's a push and pull with Colliers and having them, um, you know, maybe you reach out and say, hey, we're considering this market for this reason or want to analyze this. Are they kind of acting as internal consultants or at that whole time, both receiving what you say is, you know, go get us five great options that meet our needs in Indianapolis because we're going to, you know, consolidate and expand there. Or, um, or they'll just come back to you and say, hey, you know, we ran an analysis on this. We know you're in the market now. Here are some of the things we think that may fit, um, you know, how we know you as a client and what your needs kind of are as a client. Is there that push and pull constantly? 100%. So? Okay. 100%. So, so we all know that there's a real estate cycle that most cities around the world follow um, where it's hot or, or not hot. The, the, the mm -hmm. question always is, is that where is that city in the cycle and when is it going to be more favorable to the tenant versus more favorable to the landlord? Um, we don't have our fingers on every single city and where those markets are and we expect colliers to. Mm -hmm. So when we have uh, quarterly business reviews, uh, we'll often talk about some of those lo locations where it's starting to trend towards the, 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 the tenants. 
Um, they'll, they'll share with us uh, key information about real estate deals that are happening that could affect uh, some of our space. So there's, there's probably, I would say 30% uh, proactive activity happening on the Collier side and 70% is us telling them what we're doing and what we need and, and them responding to it. I see. Okay. That's a good relationship to have where it goes both ways. Like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, do you think you lead or follow the office wants of the employees? In other words, do you think you convert to a more flexible office and then leave the employees to understand and appreciate that? Or by the time the space is chosen, designed and built out, employees are already wanting to work in that type of environment. Um, well, I'll give you my personal philosophy. I don't know that that's different than, than SAPs, but my, my, prefer, my personal philosophy is if you have 100 desks in an office and you have 100 employees there and all 100 of them come in five days a week, it's tough to do any for, sort of flex working because every single person comes in Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. It's not reality in most locations, locations. So what we're constantly doing is looking at utilization and trying to understand is that is that the utilization for October 1st 2020 and is it going to stay that way or do we see it changing in the coming year we see do we see it changing in the coming years and, and change could be um, our current situation with working from home and how that's going to look post COVID it could be uh, growth numbers from the business if they're not growing they're not going to need any more space but maybe they're also going to have some attrition so I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's more so we want to make sure that we're providing the space that the employees need and, and, and based on how they're using it. Because an employee might say, well, I need a dedicated desk, but I'm going to work from home four days a week. Yeah, yeah, correct. Well, that, that's not really what I mean by need. What I mean by need is I want to provide you a desk for that one day a week you're in. Yeah. And then make sure you're supported from home. That's, that's what I believe you need. And so we're always looking at that utilization. And then we're, you know, as a business partner, I'm working back with the business leaders to say, we're going to make this tweak based on this information that we see. Um, and we're still here to support you, but this is what we see. And we think that we're going to, that this tweak will be beneficial for, for these reasons. It could be cost savings, but it also could be new furniture that, that, that supports that flexible kind of working that that employee that, that's coming in one day a week uh, needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, are we going to see people move out from these big cities and work from home or move to slower, more affordable areas? Some of these, call it uh, third tier cities or, or smaller cities? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. Um, I think that, that there's, a, there's a real uh, challenge on the table right now for employees that that you know pre-covid felt like they had to be near their their headquarters office or near their office because they didn't want to commute they wanted to bicycle to work mm -hmm. um for those and they were paying maybe either a high rent because they were in the city or their they, they, their uh their dollars weren't stretched quite as far because they had a house near in the in the city well, now those employees are in that expensive house or they're in that expensive apartment. Their office is closed. Their company's saying, hey, you can work, you know, from home indefinitely. And they're starting to scratch their head going, on the wall. Why do I need this expensive home or this expensive apartment if I can do what I'm doing right here and in that expensive apartment from another location that's maybe an hour away where I could buy an acre of land and, you know, have a five bedroom house. So I think that there's some of that thought process going on right now. Um, but let's face it, there are also employees who are saying, I want the office to open. I can't wait to get back. Um, I need that face-to-face -face collaboration. You know, I, I'm never going to leave this location around the building. Mm -hmm. I, my sense is, is that that percentage is lower than the, than the first situation I described. Um, but what we're trying to just figure out is what does that look like in every location? And we're doing surveys with our employees and we're saying, how is it working for you working from home right now? And we get an idea of how it's working. And uh, if you had the opportunity to stay working from home after the office opens, would you? Um, it, how many days a week would you do that? And so we're starting to feel out our employees to say, what does that look like when offices reopen? Because I think that, that in a post-COVID world, there's going to be a certain number of employees, if given the opportunity to continue working from home, that are going to say, yeah, I want to do it. And I don't need to be in the big city anymore. I'm going to move to a lower cost location. 
have you found in those surveys that there are kind of material differences in results depending on on where in the country um let's use let's use the u.s i know you're global yeah. but where in the u.s they are do you see that um let's say in the south where things have uh in some regards remained relatively unchanged they're mostly right. fine with it whereas new york and san francisco where where things couldn't be more different than they were um they kind of have very uh much more dramatic responses to the survey. Yeah, I, I think the city location will factor into it based on what their, their governors have done for, for the rules. Um, I also think there's an SAP approach to this as well, right. which is we're gonna say, hey, you know, we understand in this location that the, that the offices can open, but mm -hmm. we're gonna wait a little longer or we're gonna open, but with really strict rules and, and, and cleaning procedures. Um, I think the bigger thing is, is, is the employees themselves and what, what, uh, what options they're given. Um, that's more what will drive the, the, the decisions on coming back to the office, not so much whether the, the, the governor says the office can open or not. I think it's going to be, what can I do? What do I want to do as an employee? Um, I didn't think I could be productive working from home, but mm -hmm. clearly over the last six months I have been, or... I didn't think I could be productive and I haven't been, I can't wait to get back to the office. Like I said, I think that's a smaller percentage, um, but that's, that's the conversation I think is happening internally. And I don't think it's so much location driven as it is just an individual discussion. I think what surprised me so far in some of these surveys is I, I felt like the, the, the younger employees might want to continue working from home, but it's actually the opposite. I think the younger employees want to get back to the office and, and start interfacing with, with managers. And it might be, you know, for a lot of reasons, it could be they need a little more coaching or they're young, younger in their careers and they haven't been working from home before or ever. So it's mm -hmm. kind of weird to them. They want to get back to an office. But I think in that, you know, 20 to 27 year old or 20, maybe 23 to, to 30 year old group, that's probably our biggest group that, that is looking forward to getting back to the office. Interesting. They're probably also in smaller houses or apartments or, um, or, or living spaces overall. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it was, it was more politically correct stated in the article I read this morning, something like uh, a suitable uh, work from home option or something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning yeah. 500 square feet uh, studio apartments not cutting it. <laughs> exactly. Yep. <laughs> Certainly doesn't. Um, do you think, where do you think kind of the percentage lies more permanently going forward uh, with, with percentages working from home and percentages going to the office? I'm sure that we'll see kind of a dramatic spike on, on both directions as we, you know, reopen and move past this over the next, you know, year, year and a half. Um, and then we'll kind of, I think settle out to a new normal. Where do you think the new normal normal is long term? Well, it's like I said at the start of the call. I think the the new normal is not that different from the old normal in that Wednesdays will probably be the, mm -hmm. the, the busiest day of the week in the office. The question is going to be is if Wednesdays were when seventy percent of your uh, allocated seats showed up to the office, is it now sixty percent? Is it forty percent? That's the tougher one to understand is what the what the high point of that curve looks like on Wednesdays now, and I, and the only way we'll know is once those offices reopen, and, and it's probably not even the first month. It's probably going to have to be six months of office reopening to really understand what it looks like. But we're pretty certain that that that, that graph will will go down. It's just survey employees and trying to understand where people's minds are at to, to try and begin to guess what that looks like uh, once those offices do do open. Yeah, it's, it's almost like mimicking the, the job of airlines or uh, parking facilities as they try to kind of accurately gauge how many people are actually going to show up and be there yeah. uh, so that we can, you know, uh, sell or deliver enough tickets or spaces, but right. not have a bunch vacant. Yeah, it's a great analogy. If, if you know, if you show up to the airport parking on certain days of the week, it's tough to find a spot, but on the other days, it's it's easy you can't plan for parking based on those days when it's easy, but you certainly don't like the fact that all those parking spots are sitting empty. And so that's, that's where, where we're challenged as well is how many spaces do we create? How many of those spaces need to be dedicated spaces because the employee wants to come in five days a week, but how many of them just need to be touchdown spots because the employee comes in one to two and a half days a week 
and it's not necessarily the same space every time they come in, but it's avail it's there and available to them. That's that that's that's the that's the equation. Yeah, I understand. Um, how do you uh, think being in major cities will be important for talent acquisition? It seems um, here to four, it's been a, a relatively important thing to be in the main cities where talent is. Um, do you think COVID's going to impact that? And how do you think um, the the I guess a characteristic of or, or a trait of going after talent and the things that companies need to have will differ with that. Well, honestly, I think it's it's our younger employees that are going to dictate a lot of that because, as I said, after seeing the data that shows that our our younger employees want to return to the office, or at least that's the group that wants to return the most, um, do they want to return to that office in Seattle because they want to live in Seattle? But if they don't want to live in Seattle, um, where do they want to live? And maybe that's where the office needs to be. Uh, what's driving that, that, that post to a college grad employee to want to stay in the city? Um, and can it be offered other places? And if it can't, then I think we'll always have offices in major cities. The, the, what, what we probably won't have is it just won't be as big because we don't have to have as much space as we had previously. Yeah, I understand. Um, what are some of the key decisions or strategies that IT departments need to keep in mind or needed to keep in mind, but have often overlooked when prepping for a growing percentage of work from home? Are there things that you see that um, in hindsight, you, you know, you work through the first one or two times and now it just seemed like common sense? Well, I mean, I'm glad it hasn't started happening today, but my computer has this interesting buzz that kicks off once in a while. Oh. Um, and sitting from the office, if it happened, I could literally pick my computer up and walk down the hall and visit the help desk and say, fix this, look, 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 look at what it's doing. Yeah. I think support's a big one for, for IT departments. Um, until they have that button that I can hit that either somebody knock or shows up at my front door or pops up on my screen and says, how can I help you? I think getting support's gonna be a challenge uh, for, for people that are working from home most of the time. But once the office is reopened, I think that that one to two and a half days a week where I go into the office is going to be that day where I spend some time at the help desk as well. It's just, it's difficult right now because those offices aren't open. So mm -hmm. even once, once we're, uh, we're open again, I think that problem gets a little bit better because you have access to those people. But right now you don't because they're working from home as well. So I think support's a big one from the, uh, from the IT standpoint. Mm -hmm. Having that hybrid, is that, is that something that, you think you'll take into account um, going forward? So, for example, wanting to make sure that you have a relatively close in-person office in metros where you have work from home employees. Let's say, hypothetically, you acquire a company with 10 employees all working from home and they're happy working from home. Um, would there be some sort of need to have some central office there so that you can you know, have a place to travel in and out of and, and have a place for them to come to for that sort of thing? Well, I think in the example of acquiring a company where all of the employees are working from home, it'd be easy for us in that, in that scenario. It'd be continue working from home. Um, here are the locations where your employees are working from home where we have offices and they're mm -hmm. certainly welcome to come use those offices. I think if there were some of those employees that were working from home where we didn't have an office, we wouldn't necessarily just open an office for them. Uh, because they're 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 successful working from home right now, but we would also listen to what their what their asks and needs are. If they're hey, you know, we were uh, we wanted an office, but the company couldn't afford it, and you know, there's only eight of us here. We would probably do some sort of a WeWork or, or Regis solution for them mm -hmm. um, again to support what their needs are. I see. What's been the largest change in how we work over the last five years, and what do you think the biggest change will be in the next five years? Um, I, I, over the last five years, I, I think about office space and, and, and how we've gone through this, this, this valley of open work areas and we've, we've, we've listened to employees and, 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 and we've, we've come back from, from ice cube trays of space to maybe we break this up a little bit and we put some phone rooms in and we put some, we, we try and break up these long spaces that, that just look like, you know, uh, hundreds of ice cube trays together to say, let, we, we still need to be efficient with our office space, but uh, we've listened to what's not working and we've, 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 we've fixed some of that. That's kind of 
the, the last five years of, of space. Um, I think the next five years, because of this global event that we're going through right now, uh, collaboration, collaboration is going to change considerably. Um, I think the tools that we're using are going to get better and better. Um, you know, I, when I have uh, discussions with people about crazy future ideas and we talk about, you know, opening this Zoom call, but on the back of my, my, my laptop is a small projector where now I can see three people sitting around the table with me, they're holograms and we're actually talking just like I'm talking right now, but I can actually see them. I think we're, we're probably going to get close to that in the next five years. Um, I think that, that commuting is going to change considerably in that just more and more people are going to look for uh, ways to get to an office if they're going to an office that doesn't involve their car. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you could step outside your front door and step on a train to get to the office, you would. Not all of us can do that based on where we live, but maybe the connection between bikes and, and Ubers and, and, and buses and trains uh, will get us closer. So I think the commuting to the office is a big one as well. Do you think um, we could see kind of a big a big change with that with commuting that, um, for example, let's say a company in Bellevue, 20% of their employees commute from Snohomish County and are stuck in traffic for 60 to 90 minutes every morning at seven right. uh, when traffic is worse. Do you think that, I always thought, hey, it makes a whole lot more sense to work from home from seven to 10 and then drive in at 10. Um, I think many companies were probably hesitant to get on board with that idea, but uh, perhaps we could see maybe a dramatic shift with traffic if if more companies are okay with that. Hundred percent. I, I think that's the part of of working from home that uh, we're not talking a lot about, which is when we say, "Hey, I want to work from home one to two and a half days a week, but I want to go into the office the other one to two and a half days." Well, when I go in, I don't want to go in at seven and I don't want to come home at five. I want to go in at 10 and I want to be back home at two 30 so I can avoid the, that morning rush or that afternoon rush that some people just can't avoid. If, if I can start my day on a zoom call like this mm -hmm. and get a bunch of meetings done and then drive into the office, have all my face to face conversations or visit the help desk, mm -hmm. uh, and then come back at two 30 and finish my day then that's going to make a better, better life for me. And I'm going to be a happier employee. And if we've been doing it successfully for six months, why wouldn't my manager allow for that? So I think that's going to be a big change as well Is when people go to the office, um, in addition to how many days a week it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that could certainly impact housing values or the, the discrepancy between sky high real estate that's close to or commutable to major employment hubs and that, you know, that's farther that for most people is just unbearable. And if we can kind of um, work around that, I, I think there, there's a whole lot more opportunity there. Yeah, I agree. Um, do you recommend any services that have kind of greatly aided in company wide collaboration, kind of like you were chatting with or chatting about before in the next five years? Are there any tools or things that have uh, really positively impacted your guys' uh, ability to collaborate? Well, I think that, uh, you know, pre-March 2020, uh, Skype was the tool I used the most. Um, but what's interesting is I would say 95% of the time it was audio only mm -hmm. be because we had the ability to see each other physically. Um, we are now using Teams a lot more, and I would say at least 50% of the time the video is on. There's no mandates or anything like that that say you, says your camera has to be on, and I've been on many calls where there's six of us on the call and three of us have our cameras on and three don't. That's fine too. But I think, I think from the, uh, from the user standpoint, some of us are trying to communicate in a, in a stronger way. And sometimes to do that, having the video on helps. Um, so it's not just the switch from uh, less video to more video, but it's also a number of tools. I mentioned Skype and teams, but um, zoom is obviously huge. Um, and there's probably three to five other ones that pop up as well. I'd like to see more consistency with, with the platforms. Um, what I hate doing is getting from, from one meeting to the next using two different platforms and coming into the meeting in different ways. I think there's a big opportunity there to try and align the collaboration tools so that I can open my Outlook calendar. I can see that it's a Skype meeting. I click one button, Skype opens. I click another button, Zoom opens. It's not quite there yet, and I think that will get better. 
Yeah, I, I understand. Um, great. So let's jump into our Q and A. For those on the um, on the call here, feel free to jump in either the chat or the Q and A window at the bottom, and um, and toss your questions in there, and we'll we'll answer those. I'll start off here. Uh, which organizations benefit most from open uh, open floor plans, and which do you think benefit the least? Uh, organizationally, well, I, I think the tech companies are the ones that have pushed it from day one. Um, I think that's, that comes from an innovation and collaboration standpoint, the, the ability to quickly see if, if McKinley's here and go over and chat with him and talk about a, talk about a problem I'm having or a solution we we're working on together. So I, I think that's, that's the obvious answer for, from an open score standpoint. But I think that it doesn't work well for those that are more individual and heads down. Um, I think from an organizational standpoint, the attorneys are one of the groups we have the hardest time with, with that kind of a floor plan. Having said that, they do sit in open, open areas, but we get creative with where we put them. You know, maybe they're at the a dead end, uh, end of a floor where, you know, you have to physically want to go down there to go speak to one of the attorneys. Um, I know they'd all rather be in individual offices because they're, they are heads down and they're on, on calls all the time. So that's probably the, the group or, or, or an organization, a law firm that probably benefits the least of, from that kind of space. Um, and obviously, like I said, tech firms benefiting the most. I see. Um, transitioning from, all right, transitioning from COVID to politics, how much do you study political climate during your st uh, strategy planning? Specifically, I'm curious about your opinions on real estate markets in Bellevue and the east side versus Seattle, um, were there specific political factors that attracted you to Bellevue? <laughs> you mean there's something going on in Seattle from a politics standpoint? I haven't heard, I gotta get caught up. We here. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so let me take that in two parts, globally and then, and then with Seattle and Bellevue. G globally, we look at it on all of our, our strategy sessions, um, but it's probably more of a black and white or yes or no, thumbs up or thumbs down situation. So. Is it, is it bad or is it, is it, maybe it's red, yellow, green. Um, there are certain places around the world where it's, it's pretty uh, challenging right now from a business climate standpoint, from a, from a politics standpoint, that we might steer away from renewing a lease in or, or steer away from planning a new, a new office location there. So it absolutely factors in to the global uh, real estate planning. I think as it relates to what's going on with Seattle and Bellevue, um, initially, I, I wasn't surprised at what Amazon did um, and is doing, but I've also had somebody nudge me and say, you know, it's going to become a regional thing, right? It's not just going to be a Seattle thing. It'll be a regional thing where this tax will apply to anybody in the region. I guess my follow-up question to that is, does that kill the Seattle Bellevue tech industry and does it go somewhere else? Not day one, not year one, but over a period of time. Um, you know, just saw another announcement about Boeing making a decision, you know, this morning. So this stuff doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it might even happen well past uh, political terms that people that initiate them have. But there's a, definitely a lasting effect. And I'd hate to look back 20 years from now and say, I remember when the Seattle Bellevue area was a tech hub. And now, it's, you know, Seattle is, is not dead, but, but it's dead from a tech standpoint and Bellevue's not too far behind. I hope that's not the case, but um, Amazon's clearly sending a message that, that uh, we're gonna try and minimize this, this uh, tax on our, our company by putting 25,000 jobs into Bellevue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, do, do you have to work on that sort of thing with the, overall, uh, with the overall company? Are they working with you and kind of helping to give you directives on you know, this climate's a little tough right now here. And so uh, we want to minimize our exposure to that, or we feel kind of overly exposed or at the whims of um, local fluctuations or politicians in this market. And so if you could, you know, um, if, if you could take that into account, or is it going the other way around where you're saying, hey, you know, I'm on the ground here in, in Seattle and here's, um, here's the things we're seeing and kind of shoot that upward to the company overall. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's my job to bring that to the attention of those either around me or, or my boss and say, hey, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, from Germany, you haven't seen this thing going on in Seattle. They may have, but, they, but I'm guessing they haven't. Um, and so a quick summary of what's going on, what the tax is, what, what Amazon's doing. And then usually the follow-up question is, is, 
does it affect us? And it does affect us because Qualtrics has a big office in downtown Seattle, and I'm certain that they will, they will fall within that range as well. Um, we haven't announced any response to it or any actions or anything, but it does impact us, and we are we are running calculations on that on what that impact is. I see. Um, great. Well, if there aren't any further questions, thank you so much, Al. Really ap appreciate you joining us. Um, this is a very timely conversation to have, and so um, it's great to hear your insight on this being on the ground. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, also to our sponsors, our deal maker sponsors, DLR Group, GLY Construction, as well as our developing leaders annual sponsors, Karen Cross Hempelman, Moss Adams, Tarragon, and Touchstone. Uh, the recording of the webinar will be made available on the NAOP Washington website. And then also wanted to invite everyone to the next virtual event, um, our current and prospective member mixer on October 13th, as well as our next breakfast, Mass Timber, Current Trends and Future Use on October 21st. We hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us and everyone have a nice rest of your day. Thanks for coming. Yeah.